Good morning, everyone. In whatever language is comfortable to you, good morning. I'm so grateful that my uh, photo up there was a little photoshopped. <laughs> it's my privilege to be with you today. But before I give you my few remarks, I want you to just look around. This is the power of family. This is the power of voice and advocacy. This is the power of community. Your voices matter. Your advocacy matters. You matter. Your children matter. It is, as I said, my privilege to join with you this morning for the Federation's Visions of Community Conference. I want to acknowledge and thank the Federation for Children with Special Needs for their legacy of advocacy, learning, listening, support, and assistance to parents of children with disabilities. To Rich Robison, who's as old as I am, the difference is women can get blonder, men just get grayer. <laughs> the staff and the board for your efforts. And I would like to thank Dr. Josie Badger, the Federation's keynote today, for gracing us with your presence. As we look towards the future, sometimes it's good to take a brief look back. And clearly, Rich and I did not synchronize our remarks, so you're going to hear this a second time. 2015 marked the 40th anniversary of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Of course, Massachusetts paved the way with the passage of Chapter 766, our special education law. So we have a lot to be proud of in the Commonwealth but that just creates the basis for what we know we need to do more of. And in 2014, Massachusetts passed Chapter 226, an act relative to assisting individuals with autism and other intellectual or developmental disabilities. This law codified recommendations made by an Autism Commission, which included many family members. Some of the law's requirements included requiring MassHealth, which is our Medicaid program for those of you who might be new to Massachusetts, to cover medically necessary treatment, including ABA therapies. Changing the eligibility criteria for the Department of Developmental Services, which you heard, to include adults with, uh, with, adult, with I'm sorry, autism spectrum disorder. Creating tax-free savings accounts, known as ABLE, achieving a better life experience for their loved ones and establishing a permanent autism commission, which includes families and individuals diagnosed with auti autism spectrum disorder. Later this month, Governor Baker will be appointing the first executive director of the Autism Commission for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But I don't stand here today to catalog the enactment of laws, although we know how essential they are to create the basis of access and opportunity for all of our citizens. I also don't stand here today to catalog all that is provided by the Commonwealth's Health and Human Services public agencies to support individuals across the lifespan, families, and communities. That would take a long time, and we don't have that because there's some wonderful speakers and groups that you need to be with today. Joining today's conference includes Nikki Osborne, and I know she will be here, who's the Commissioner of the Mass Rehab Commission, Elin Howe, Commissioner of the Department of Developmental Services, and Heidi Reed, who I believe has been to every one of these conferences, who's the Commissioner of the Commission of Deaf and Understanding. As you heard, there's also staff from the Departments of Mental Health and Public Health, including from DPH's Division for Children and Youth with, with Special Health Needs. And I would encourage you to check out their, in the corner, but a very powerful, um, their booth with a lot of information with you. And I did promise them I wouldn't say that there was candy on the table. Um, oops, I'm sorry, did I do that? The executive of Health and Human Services represents half of state government. So this is what half a state government looks like, comprised of 12 state agencies in addition to Medicaid. It consumes half of the state budget, both in terms of funding and public employees. I also proudly serve as chair of the Autism Commission. EOHHS touches the lives of one in four residents of the Commonwealth, some of our most vulnerable children, youth, adults, and elders. 
Three small but powerful words guide my interactions. Health, resilience, and independence. We are charged with improving health outcomes, building resilience, and maximizing independence, thus contributing to the quality of life for individuals, families, and communities. Just one example of the governor's commitment to supporting families, as you heard from Commissioner Howe, was an, is an increase in respite and family supports for next year's budget. It represents an 11% increase for FY17 for family and respite services in the Commonwealth. I will tell you that was the easiest conversation I had with the governor because the budget's still a little tight in the Commonwealth and as advocates, you need to advocate. I want you to advocate for your needs, for your family needs. But when I sat with the governor and said that we needed to increase family supports and respite for families, it was not even a, it was just like, of course. So you need to know that about Governor Baker. He believes in supporting families. As we look towards the future, let me offer a few thoughts from the Baker administration. We will always listen to the voices and experience of individuals with disabilities or challenges and their loved ones as we shape public policies. Two areas of particular interest as we look towards the future are agency boundary spanning and transitions. Don't worry, it's not that fancy. By boundary spanning, I mean that the needs of individuals, and particularly your loved ones, do not always fit neatly into how government programs are organized and funded. And by transitions, I mean those life transitions, and particularly for families as youth age from school into adulthood. I don't have the answers today, but I will listen and you will be heard, and that is my commitment. My professional journey, as is true for many, is shaped by personal journeys, which has been impacted, in my case, by three generations of family members with serious mental illness. My niece has schizoaffective illness that was not diagnose, diagnosed until she, until she was well into her adolescence. Although she had experienced symptoms for many years and came close to dropping out of school. Today, she has her associate's degree, she works part-time, and is an abstract painter. In fact, I bought one of her first paintings and she would not give me a family discount. <laughs> she now has a strong network of family, professional support, and professional support who listens to her. And as she is known to say, it doesn't hurt to have a former commish as her primary case manager when the chips are down. For a long time, her safety net, as I'm sure many of you have experienced, for a long time, her safety net was fragile, and I provided a lot of strength to my younger sister. There wasn't respite or much in the way of family-to-family -family support where they lived, so I do get it. Our roles may be different, and we may have different perspectives on occasion, so we may not always agree of the, all the time of what the immediate priorities are, but I do need you to be critical friends in your advocacy for your loved ones and for your families because we share the goal of full participation, independent living, and economic self-sufficiency. And that inclusion contributes to all of our well-being. Thank you and have a wonderful conference and thank you for having me.